Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show, where we help you make the wisest and most profitable decisions. My name is Dr. Glob Sapursky, and the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, the future of work consultancy that sponsors the Wise Decision Maker Show. And today I'll tell you about some surprising developments in hybrid work policy from a couple of new studies. So let's talk a little, little bit about what you've been seeing in the headlines. There have been a lot of headlines about return to office mandates. Amazon, Disney, Starbucks, AT&T, many others ordering employees back to the office. So you might think this is inevitable, but do such headlines represent the reality of a new wave or are they really clickbait for anxious workers that don't want to return to the office? What's actually happening here? So there's a new study from the conference board that shows that companies approach hybrid workplace policy in a much more complex way than the headlines suggest. So the survey of 1,100 corporate executives globally, not workers, but executives, including 24% of them are from the United States, so over 200 from the United States, over 250 from the United States, and it shows that US CEOs' plans regarding remote work, that 3% plan to decrease availability, and then 5% plan to increase availability. So most don't plan to make any changes. Amazon, Disney, and Starbucks just belong to those 3%. They represent the exception, not the rule. There are some shifting perspectives on hybrid work, remote work. For example, Elon Musk at Twitter, which of course is now called X, ordered all staff back to the office. But he later reversed course and embraced remote work by closing offices in Singapore and Seattle and telling all staff to work remotely. <laughs> Previously, somehow, remote work wasn't acceptable. Now, when it actually benefits the bottom line of the company, it's acceptable. And so here's what we're seeing also with employee pushback. Employees pushing back strongly on the return to work mandates. For example, with Amazon, there was a walkout of employees. With YouTube, there was contractor strike about this and plenty of other strikes and opposition actions, petitions signed, public leaking of documents that are showing a rise of worker power and union activity around forced return to office mandates. So it's likely that over the coming years, we'll see an expansion of workers spending more time working remotely within mostly a hybrid modality. So spending some time in the office, spending some time working at home, but overall spending more time at home than they have been up to now, at least some of the time, like I said. Hybrid workplace policies are proving successful for most companies. So I've helped over two dozen companies figure out their transition to hybrid work, remote work. 24 of them have chosen a hybrid first model and two of them chose a remote first model. So hybrid first seems to be definitely the most popular route. So what's the other benefits of this policy? Well, it offers a lot of increased flexibility for employees, especially due to the lack of commute. So that is both increased flexibility in general and the lack of a commute in particular are very beneficial. People really like that and they're willing to sacrifice significant pay for that. In fact, a Mercer survey also showed that people are highly productive. 94% of staff were equally or more productive working remotely compared to the office. And a Great Place to Work survey showed that over 800,000 staff shifted to working remotely during the pandemic. Of course, this is in the US. And that resulted in worker productivity increase by 6%. So this was a survey of staff. Of course, overall, more people shifted to working remotely during the pandemic, but this was a survey of staff. So there was an increase in worker productivity. And what about less productive employees? So we do see that there are some people who are less productive. Companies need to identify staff, and I've worked with my clients to identify staff who are struggling with remote work and provide coaching and sometimes asking them to come to the office. And in fact, Jane Fraser, the, C the CEO of Citibank, said that we measure productivity carefully and then implementing office return for people who are struggling to provide a more structured environment, which is definitely something that I've been working on with my clients and that has worked out well for staff who are struggling and need more structure. Flexibility provides improved work-life balance. So it allows employees to work from convenient locations that allows them to take care of tasks in their personal lives, and that increase, leads to increased job satisfaction. So Cisco's survey of 28,000 staff shows that 78% say hybrid work improved their overall well-being. Now, it also offers employers and employees cost savings. But let's talk about employers. So obviously for employees, they don't need to do the commute. They don't need to pay for dry cleaning, for 
for lunch around the office, which is quite a bit more expensive, but companies save money too. There's a reduced need for office space, utilities, office supplies. Elon Musk discovered this, which is why he closed the Singapore and Seattle offices. But there are some challenges with this approach, which really come from these cognitive biases. And that has to do with how our brain is wired. And the availability heuristic is one of these cognitive biases where we make mistakes about reality and we have miswirings, these cognitive biases that cause us to make bad decisions. The availability heuristic causes us to base judgments on easily available information. For example, leaders have personal experience with remote work, which is not as good as many of their followers. Many leaders, in fact, I was talking about two weeks ago to the CEO of a mid-sized credit union who told me that he worked throughout the pandemic in the office. So he came to the office and he was the only one. He came to the office every day. He sat in an empty office and he worked there and he couldn't realize or he had trouble realizing why other people wouldn't come to the office. But he was fine. He was safe. And so that wasn't a problem for him. But of course, everyone else, it's not only about safety, but they also had very fine home environment setups and they were capable of working from home, whereas he had a lot of trouble just separating that work-life balance, separating that work from home activities. So they overlook the unique needs of their organization and the differences from what their staff actually experience. Another is the sunk cost fallacy. It's a tendency to continue investing in the decision or strategy despite its ineffectiveness. For example, a lot of leaders launched an initial hybrid work policy, returned to office, and later surveys show that over 80% of them regretted their initial approach to return to the office, but they didn't really change their initial approaches, even if it's not working well for their organization. So leaders really need advice and training on how to improve their approach to hybrid work in general, the return to the office and this continuation of day-to-day -day activities in the office. For example, I was working with one company, it's an IT services company, which struggled with making the workplace transition to hybrid work from purely remote work during the pandemic. So there was a productivity decline, staff dissatisfaction as they went from full-time remote work to hybrid work. And that happened because of communication, collaboration issues among staff who were working remotely versus in the office. So a lot of coordination troubles, communication troubles, hybrid meetings, which they had trouble with. So the resolution had to do with having much more coordination, weekly one-on-one -on -one meetings between employees and their supervisors and training them, which I did on more clear communication and collaboration, how to have effective hybrid meetings, for example. And the company performance stabilized after these changes. They improved their productivity, collaboration, communication, and they had some of the benefits of socializing and increased team belonging, which they wanted from coming to the office. So you really need to rethink your approach to hybrid work. COVID reshaped our work approaches and hybrid work policy is popular because it offers flexibility and adaptability while still benefiting collaboration, teamwork, socializing, and bond, team bonding. But leaders need to be mindful of these biases in decision-making because they can cause them to make bad decisions around hybrid work. So companies can successfully navigate the challenges and maximize their bottom lines for careful planning, regular reviews, and addressing these cognitive biases. All right. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Wise Decision Maker Show. Please make sure to subscribe wherever you checked out the show and leave a review. It helps others discover the show and it helps us improve the show.